Welcome. We are going to do um, a problem variety today, uh, actually a couple of different ones. Uh, these are called either welds in bending or welds in torsion. The first, one, first example that I have up here is a weld in torsion. Um, this is probably going to look familiar to a lot of you because this is very similar to the analysis that we did for bolt groups, uh, and it's going to have a similar look and feel to that. Uh, kind of the basic steps is that first, uh, if you have this an eccentric load, for instance, like the one that's shown here, uh, the first thing that we have to do is get that converted into uh, kind of a translational effect as well as a rotational effect applied at a centroid. And after that, then we look separately at the effects of each of those um, uh, components that happen on the welds. Uh, and then kind of lastly, we combine them together into one unified value for the amount of stress that a particular weld feels. So this is different from the example we did last time because the example we did last time had a line of action of the applied force that went through the centroid of the weld group, whether or not we mentioned that, that was one of the characteristics of that. Now we have a load that does not pass, the, the line of action of which does not pass through the centroid of the weld group, and therefore it generates not only a uh, kind of a translational effect in the welds, but it also creates this rotational effect and I'm going to show you today how we can handle those uh, two pieces. So uh, the first thing that we need to do is to figure out um, where exactly is the centroid of the weld group. So what we're dealing with here is a piece that's welded with uh, quarter inch welds to another piece. Those welds are basically along the top and along one edge. Okay, the, le the left edge is shown there. Um, and so the first thing I need to say about this is that we typically uh, kind of abstract these welds uh, in our minds and think of them as sort of uh, rectangles, right? You think of a rectangular piece of weld and another rectangular piece of weld so that when we come up with where the centroid location is, it's like a rectangle here and a rectangle here, the width of which would be the size of the weld and the um, length of which is given kind of on the the view that is shown right here. Um, so having said that though, uh, with these types of problems, um, we are going to rely a pretty good bit on a table of information that is in the book. And so that's kind of where I want to start with this is by showing you table 9-1. Okay. So if you have your book, I would recommend you flip and look at uh, table 9-1. And uh, you see several different shapes of weld groups uh, that are given in that table. They, uh, on the, the previous discussions that they have uh, in the text there, uh, they kind of show you how they arrive at, these, at some of these expressions. Um, and we're going to use the information in this table a, a decent amount. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice in table 9-1 uh, is we have a few different types of, of weld groups there, which one do you feel like is um, the one that most closely relates to the situation that I have here? Okay. Someone says, uh, you know, entry three in that table seems to be the best one. And I agree because it's kind of an L shape. Okay. So we look at, at entry three. And one of the things that you'll notice is that the uh, X and Y centroid equations are actually given in there. And having said that, those are, you know, fairly easy to go back and rederive and see where they got those. It's nothing fancy. It's just a, a plain old um, centroid calculation based on the rectangles I started off uh, talking about there. And so since it's nothing fancy, we may as well go ahead and use that information. So that's where we'll start here is we're going to start by finding the centroid. Okay, and this is actually going to be a little bit more involved than the example we did for bolts uh, because we need to do a centroid. Can we get away with just a centroid in one direction or not? Probably not. We've, since this thing is not a symmetric shape, uh, there, we don't get any benefit from looking at symmetry or anything like that. We actually have to compute both directions of the centroid. So, um, so let's go ahead and do that. And... Uh, 
what we need to do is match the shape we have to the shape that's in the book. Okay, and that takes a little bit because the shape that's in the book is not oriented exactly the same. Let me do this. In the book, in the x direction for the book, that matches with dimension b, right? Dimension b is uh, acting in the x direction. And so one of the things that you'll notice is that the two equations they have for the centroids both have the same denominator, but the numerator of the x direction has that b term. So all we need to basically do is match the dimension that we're measuring to the dimension um, you know, that's in the same direction, right? Um, and, uh, and use the correct uh, use the correct equation for that case. So like for instance, if let's say we define the little corner point up here to be our origin, okay? Where are my centroids going to be? Okay, so that's, you know, let's say that that's the, the origin. So that means I have, and I kind of set up my axes already right there. So I'll use those axes that are already shown. Okay, what would be my x coordinate for that centroid? Okay, they give it x bar right here. It says b squared. What's b as it pertains to uh, this problem? Okay, it'll be that five inch dimension because it's in the direction that I'm working with. And it says it's that squared. So five inches squared. Okay, divided by two times five inches plus, and then D is the other dimension. So that would be uh, three inches. Okay. And this ends up being 1.5625 inches. Okay. Now, what about the y dimension? Okay. Same idea, but now we use three inches over two times uh, five inches plus three inches. Okay, now if you want to be really strict with the signs, okay, you might notice that the centroid is actually located to the negative y. So if I want to be strict with the signs, I'd want to put a negative on here as well. And this ends up being, um, let's see, 0.5625 inches. All right, and this is important because a lot of things revolve around where is the location of that centroid. The reason everything, because that was kind of a pun, wasn't it? The reason everything revolves around the centroid is that is where we assume the axis of rotation is going to be for any little deflection that happens in this weld group, okay? And that actually can be sort of proven in a little bit more formal way, but we're gonna take that for granted uh, for today, okay? So let's go ahead and sketch this weld group and uh, do it a little bit bigger so that we can draw some things on it. So here's the weld group. Again, it can be, it can be fairly abstract. You don't have to draw uh, rectangles or anything. We're really gonna just sort of treat them as lines. Okay, and we're saying that this is a five inch length right here. We're saying this is a three inch length over here. All right. We're also saying that we know that the centroid location is about one and a half inches. So see, that'd be right in here somewhere and about a half inch down. So maybe somewhere in here. Okay. So one point, let's see. 1.5625 inches to there and 0.5625 inches down from here. All right, so far so good. Now what we need to do is we started off with this 500 pound load that was out on the end of this lever. What we need to do is bring that load 
using our equivalent force couple system technique that we've done before, bring that load back to the centroid, okay? Which part of that is easy. Part of that is saying, whatever you had out on the end, just go ahead and put it right there at the centroid, okay? So that's 500. But what do we need to add to make this right? A moment, okay? So we need to add to this a moment that acts in the direction that it would act, given the fact that the 500 pounds is actually uh, significantly to the right of where uh, this particular location is. All right, so then the next question is, um, how far is that 500 pounds from that centroid point? Okay. Yeah, if you think about this, it's going to be 30 inches to this edge, okay? We know that it's actually 1.5625 back from the far edge, so it's really going to be like 35 minus 1.5625, right? So let me go ahead and put that on here and say, you know, go ahead and, and calculate that as well. 35 minus 1.5625 gives us... 33.4375. All right. And so now, how much is this moment going to be? How, how, uh, how large is the magnitude of that moment? Well, we take the 33.4375 and multiply it by the load 500 pounds. So that gives me uh, 16,718.75 inch pounds. All right, so we've kind of done the preliminaries now. Um, what we need to do now is we need to move into more of the crux of the problem, all right? You might remember when we did bolt groups that we split the uh, stresses. Actually, in that case, we were splitting forces into primary shearing forces and secondary shearing forces. The primary ones handled the idea that there was this translational effect happening, right? And the secondary ones handled the rotational effect. And so we're going to do that same thing here so primary um, and I'm going to actually call this primary shear stress. This is one of the things that's different for this relative to uh, what we did for the secondary stuff. Okay. And I'll just, I, I do want to put this note up here so that everyone remembers. This is for translational effect. And this is for the, the uh, rotational effect. Okay. All right, so let's start with the easy one. Primary shearing stress. This is easy because all you do is you take, it, it's no different than what we did last time, basically. You take the amount of force, you divide it over the amount of throat area you have in the weld group, and that's your stress, all right? Super simple. So what we have there is 500 pounds, okay? And so let me, I'll, I'll use the tau prime uh, notation here. It's just V over A where V is your shearing force, which is 500 pounds. And how much area do I have? Well, this is something you can go back and use our techniques we used a little while back. Or you might notice in table 9.1, it even gives you a little summary of, of uh, what that area is going to be in that table. And it says it's going to be 0 0.707 times H. What's H? Okay, quarter inch welds, so H is the weld size, and we put in, uh, you know, 0.25. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to slide this to the next line. All right, and then what? 
times b plus d. Okay? And now that whole formula makes sense based on what we did last time. So b, 3 inches, or 5 inches, I guess, plus 3 inches. I told you about Dr. Lee, my uh, engineering professor. He had a funny sense of humor. And whatever you would say, if you'd say 5 inches plus 3 inches, he'd say no. 3 inches plus 5 inches. Yeah. He was a funny, funny fellow. All right. So if you actually put this in here and calculate it, it gives you 353.6 PSI. <clears throat> you know, we in engineering school, we don't ask for much with respect to humor, right? So I'll, uh, you know, see if I can boost that game a little bit here. All right, so we've got um, our primary shearing stress here, super simple. Let's go to um, our secondary shearing stress now, okay? And this is a little bit more tricky, okay? This is a little bit more tricky because um, we actually need to kind of figure out a few different locations. And here's what I want to show you. Any radial line that I draw with respect to this centroid, let's say I draw, this is just a random radial line that I draw out to some weld location. What direction do you think the stress is going to be on the weld um, at any particular location at just some random line that I draw out to the weld? It's always going to be perpendicular, right? Each location throughout the weld, the stress direction, because we're dealing with this pure uh, rotational effect, the stress direction is always going to be uh, reacting in a perpendicular direction here. You know, so if I pick a location right there, that would be the direction of the stress that would act in a location right there. If I, you know, drew another line out to some other location, that line would now be different, right? Okay. The reason it's like this is the, uh, you're assuming that since we chose this centroid location, when you start to twist this, there is a pure rotational effect that happens around that centroid location. And because there's a pure rotational effect, that actually means that the strain at these locations where the weld is attached, the strain is going to uh, act kind of along, you know, if you actually think about the movement, it's going to be happening along those lines. So the strain happens along those lines, therefore the stress happens along those lines. It's a, it's a difficult thing to describe because you're talking about deformations, but it's because the strain is always going to act along a line that's perpendicular to those, um, those radial lines, okay? So now having said that, um, let me show you the, the equation that we are planning on using to compute secondary shear, and I want to want you to think about where we might have our worst case scenarios on this, uh, you know, profile or, or this uh, weld, weld group, given the fact that we are basically just going to use the same equation that we used for torsion when we were way back in your first uh, statics, mechanics, and materials class. So um, it is basically just torque times radius over polar moment of inertia. Okay. And so where do you think our, our difficulty is probably going to be in the actual computation of this? Yeah. It's probably going to be in that J, right? That's where the actual meat of the problem is going to be located, is coming up with a reasonable value for J. You might remember that back in um, your uh, first statics and mechanics and materials class, we basically kept everything in terms of just uh, circular members. And then along the way somewhere in one of your, early, uh, your later classes, you may have done some things where you had torsion in members that were not circular. Well, now we have even another thing where we have to have some way of calculating this J, okay? And that's where having this table that I'm going to show you is, is super handy. All right. Well, if this is the formula, let me say a couple things about it. The T that you have up here doesn't change regardless of wherever you look in the weld group. Like if you actually go look at other locations within the weld group, um, your T doesn't change. Your T is just your applied torque. 
Okay? Do you think J changes? J also doesn't change. It is just an, kind of an area property of the uh, weld group and kind of its shape. And so J also doesn't change. What about R? Okay, R definitely changes as you move to various locations in the weld group. And so actually what you find is that the magnitude of these stresses as you move to different locations in the weld group, the further away you get from the centroid, and so it's kind of not a mistake that this vector right here looks a little bit longer than this vector, right? Because as you move further away from the centroid, you expect that the stress value is going to increase because that R value is increasing, right? So this, you know, you have an R um, yet for that location, you have another R for this location. And as that R gets bigger and bigger, you end up with more and more stress, okay? So what we're always doing when we do, you know, kind of design problems or evaluation problems for, you know, is it suitable, right? Because what we're supposed to do here, we're supposed to find the worst case weld stress for this connection. That was what the instruction was at the very beginning. Um, there's no, there's no point in calculating it a bunch of places if it's easy to do by inspection and just figure out where you think the worst case is going to be just based on inspection. Okay? So here's my question. Looking at, at this weld group, where do you suspect your worst case scenario is going to be for secondary shearing stress? Okay? Top right corner. All right? That is definitely one of the candidates, right? So you have a reaction uh, stress that happens up here. I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and draw a line, a radial line out to that point. <clears throat> and I'll try to draw this a little bit more perpendicular here. All right. That is going to be one of my candidates for where my worst case stress might be. Okay, um, and so let me just call this uh, tau double prime sub one. So here's my next question. Are there other candidates for where this worst case stress could possibly be? Okay, and some of you are probably on the right track with what you're thinking. You're saying, I have not yet shown the effect of this primary shearing stress on the weld group. The primary shearing stress basically reacts at each point against this 500 pounds, right? So you imagine there being this distributed stress of 353.6 PSI that is, you know, everywhere within this weld group, and it always is going to point in this direction, right? So that means right here we also have this primary shearing stress that's reacting uh, against the applied loads, okay? Well, this primary shearing stress also is distributed all the way along this edge. Okay, so now let's look at what the effect would be at any other possible candidates for where the, uh, the worst case could be. I would basically say every vertex is a possible candidate, right? Like so, both of those would be potential candidates, right? So now let's look at this. We have a uh, stress that would act in that direction right there that would re be reacting against the uh, 16, 7, 18.75 inch pounds, and we would have another stress that would be reacting up here against that one. All right, which one of these radius values is longest, do you think? That top right one is definitely longest, okay? Now, let's think about the other question of stress combination, right? What we do with this is very similar to how we combine forces whenever we were doing our bolt problems. It matters if the, you know, are the stresses aligned with each other going the same direction, or are they more anti-aligned with each other, because that can have an effect on the stress that you actually see at a particular location. For this particular example, can we do by inspection and figure out where the worst case stress might be? Yeah, so let's think through the logic of why we can do that, okay? 
We can do that because our equation tells us the worst case secondary shear stress is going to be worst where R is the longest. You agree with that? So that says, well, this is where my secondary shearing stress is going to be the worst. All right. Additionally, we also know that we have this primary shearing stress that acts everywhere. And now we look and see how do those align. And you say, between my choices of where my worst case can be, I definitely am most aligned uh, at the location where I already had the largest secondary shearing stress anyway. Right? And so the, my, my conclusion out of all of this is to basically say there are no other, um, you know, there are no other candidates that could possibly have as much stress in them as that location right there. Okay? Let me ask you, what did I save by going through this logic? Okay? I saved having to check other locations that could be the critical locations. Right? This is definitely a, a discipline that's helpful. And this is the kind of thing that makes you uh, effective, is to be able to see that stuff more from the beginning. And so that's why I spent a little bit of time doing that. All right, so let's look at that location right there. Okay, I numbered it thinking that I might do some of these other ones. I'll go ahead and number the other ones too. Let's say this is, you know, tau sub two, tau double prime two, and tau double prime oh, three. But I've basically said I don't need to look at those because they are not going to be my worst case. All right, so let's get into the details of calculating. Uh, a secondary shearing stress at that location that I just identified. All right, so um, again, the T, that's actually pretty, pretty easy. R is not too hard. We've got to do a little bit of geometry, but let's get started with J first, okay? J is the, uh, again, the polar moment of inertia. And I want to direct your attention to entry three again in table 9-1. And one of the things that they define for you there is something that they call J sub U. Okay. And, um, you know, they don't do a, a real clear job of defining that right there on the table. Fortunately, they have it defined um, a little bit better on the previous page, 475. And they basically say, um, you know, right at the bottom of the page, the relationship between J and the unit value of J is given with the equation J is equal to 0.707H times J sub U. So what does it look like they're doing with that? They're assuming, well, they're actually put H in there as a variable, right? So what they're doing is they're allowing you to generalize the value of J with the J sub U that's given in the table they're allowing you to generalize so that it works for any width of weld or any weld size. That's why they have to have the J sub U, so they're making it general enough to handle any weld size. And then they handle this, you know, and in, insert the information of what the weld size is with the transition going from J sub U to J. So that's what's going on with those equations. So um, we'll go ahead and just calculate J sub U based on the formula given in Table 9.1. This is uh, B plus D, okay, I, I'll put in the values. B was uh, five inches uh, plus three inches, and that is to the fourth minus six. Okay, here it actually, you know, I guess it doesn't end up mattering for this one, um, which one is B and which one is D. Got to be careful, some of them it might matter, but... In this case, it doesn't matter. So minus 6 times b squared times d squared over 12 times b plus d. All right. Now, what kind of units does this give me? Okay, in the numerator, I have inches to the fourth. In the denominator, I have inches. So this gives me a value in inches cubed. And the number ends up being 
inches cubed. Okay. So now going to J, this is where we go from the unit value of the uh, polar moment of inertia to the actual you know, value including the weld size information. We multiply by 0 0.707, which again takes into account that we're only taking the throat, right, times H. times J sub U. Um, so the question that just came out, is there any place in the text where you don't use the 0 .707? Um, the answer is this, two-prong answer. Yes, in the text there are some places where they do not use that. They have a technique shown in some of the example problems where they uh, kind of evaluate a bonding strength between the weld and the parent material, and for that they use the straight area uh, based on the weld size. And, uh, you know, that's fine if they want to have that there in the book. Um, I prefer to always use the 0 .707 and only use the area for the throat, okay? The reason for that is, again, I'm, I'm not enough of an expert to tell you what works best, and it makes me more comfortable to assume uh, that I have less area rather than more, right? Makes your, uh, makes your calculations a little bit more conservative. Yes, sir? So the question that was just asked, if, if the weld on the top was a different size than the weld on the side, uh, could I still use this technique of pulling that J value out of the uh, table? So then the answer to that, um, you know, where we have to get the answer to that is by, you know, trying to read some of this. And um, the answer to it is, yeah, kind of. But what you probably want to do instead is there is a technique that they show in the evaluation of J in the first place. Um, and actually, I'll point your, your attention to equation D on page 475. That is probably more the technique that you would want to try to use um, in order to evaluate J if, the, if you have a weld group that has different weld sizes. So you wouldn't go to the table, you would go to the, an equation that looked more like that. Equation D can have more terms than that added to it. Um, you know, if you have a weld group that has more than two lines to it, but it's going to be most applicable for, for situations where you do have linear segments. All right, so what comes out of this is 5.056 inches to the fourth. All right. What's next? Okay. I figure out my secondary shearing stress. Uh, yeah, radius. Someone, someone said radius, all right? I haven't figured that part out yet. So how do I figure out that radius? Okay, that radius is going to be the square root of 0.5605, oh, 0.625, excuse me, inches squared plus what? Five inches minus 1.5625 inches squared. Okay, that's the length of that hypotenuse, and that does give me the value of R. All right, which I believe I have that in here. Um, R ends up being 3.483 inches. Okay, so now we go down here and we plug that in. We say 
We, we need to know our applied uh, torque, which is 16, 7, 18.75 inch pounds. We need to plug in our value of R, 3.483 inches. And then plug in our value of J, which was 5.056 inches to the fourth. All right, and that gives us <coughs> 11,517.3 PSI. About 11 KSI or so, 11 and a half KSI. Not too bad. All right. But we're still not done. Why not? Got to combine them, okay? And so to combine them, what we need to do is we need to uh, look at the geometry. And this is a little bit different because whenever we do uh, components, typically in the past, we've been doing that on forces. This is one of the few times where I am going to consider components of stresses. But it works the same way, okay? Um, at least for these examples because we're looking at a particular point, right? So we can take components of the stress and then combine those components together with the same type of technique. So what would that look like? Okay, I would say uh, my overall shear that I have at location one is going to be equal to the square root of what? Let's, let's get to that in just a second. Let's look at the x and y components. It'd be the square root of the x component squared plus the y component squared. So let's look at the x component. What is the x component of stress that happens at that point? Okay. Again, we've got to do a little bit of geometry. What's the slope of this? Okay, there's a rise of 0.5625 for a run of, I guess I never did put that in. I think I have it in here though. Let's see, the run is 3.4375. Okay, so when I'm figuring out the uh, when I'm figuring out the x component that I have here, I take the total amount that I have from the secondary shear because it's the only component that has an x component. The primary shear is entirely in the y direction. Okay, so I take that. 11,000, what was it, 517.3 PSI, and multiply it by, okay, and here's the thing. I know the slope here. How does that slope relate to the slope of the actual line of action? They are going to be reciprocals of one another, and you can, you know, identify that up here and say this would be a run of 0.5. 625 for a rise of 3.4375. And so that tells me that I have this x component. Uh, it is going to be negative, by the way, because it goes to the left. And we're going to multiply by 0.5625 over the square root of, well, really, what, what could I make the square root there? Okay, it's the same calculation basically that I did up here to find the radius, right? So you can just use that radius value without the inches on it. So 3.483 right there. Does everyone see what I did there? Okay, so this ratio right here picks off just the X uh, component of that shear. All right, and so I think I do have that up here. It gives me negative uh, 1860 PSI. Okay, 
Now what about for the y direction? Okay, similar kind of thing, only this time we have a positive 11, 5, 17, uh, 0.3 PSI. Now we need to multiply by, we still have the same denominator that we use, 3.483 for that denominator, but now we use the um, 3.4375 as the numerator to pick off just the vertical component of that stress. But we need to add something as well, right? Okay, it may not make a whole lot of difference, but we do have the primary shear as well. Okay, 353.6 PSI. This is a good opportunity for me to say that uh, I've seen some analyses where, especially if there's a long cantilever like this, um, where basically the effect of the primary shear stress is at some point neglected. Right? Why do you think that might happen? Because it becomes really small compared to the secondary shearing stress. We're not doing that here, but I just mentioned that that's not uncommon for that to ha occur on occasion, if there's a good justification for why uh, it's insignificant relative to the other items. All right. So what does this end up being? This ends up being 11720.4 PSI. Okay. And so that tells me that my shearing stress that I have at that location is going to be equal to the square root of negative 1860 PSI squared plus 11720.4 PSI squared. All right, and that ends up giving me 11,867.1 PSI. Answer, All right? So any questions on this problem? Yes. And ah, yeah. So this is a good a good question that was just asked. Uh, the question was about stress concentration factors. So, um, and you may actually remember from last time we mentioned that at the end of a weld, sometimes there might be a stress concentration factor at the end of a weld. And so, uh, a reasonable person would look at this and say, "Man, couldn't there be a stress concentration factor because we're right at the end of that weld?" And uh, the answer is, again, you know, a lot of times has multiple layers. Um, I would say, yes, it, there will be a stress concentration factor that will probably be more severe at the end of a weld like this. Um, having said that, what do we often do if we have static loading and we have stress concentrations? Have you ever seen us before neglect the stress concentration factors? when we are dealing with static loading. Actually, there's two conditions we usually check for. Is it static loading and is it a ductile material? Right? If those two conditions are met, what do we often do? A lot of times we ignore the stress concentration factor. Why do we do that? Okay. So it, the answer that someone gave is that the load's not increasing and decreasing and with fatigue. Why that's important is that um, for materials that are ductile, we might remember what the shape is generally of a, you know, and I'll say that even though the shape of the stress strain curve might look something like this, where this is strain and this is stress. Um, a lot of times we think of this as being more of a straight line up like this with a straight line over like this. That's called the elastic perfectly plastic model 
of uh, material behavior. Okay. Um, if you actually uh, take a material up to the point where it yields, all right, and there is a and it's a stress concentration, meaning there's only a very small amount of material that's experiencing that highest stress. What happens to that material if it is ductile at that point? What happens is it deforms a little bit. And when it deforms a little bit, what do you think happens to those stress fields? They kind of redistribute, right? And because they redistribute, if we're dealing with a static load, we kind of don't care, right? It redistributed. It took that high stress value, and because the material was able to deform a little bit right there where it was the highest stress, it ends up, and, and when it does that, it still maintains this level of strength, right? As it deforms a little bit, it's still holding on, and so it has now redistributed that load out a little bit to more material, and we, we're fine. So it's pretty customary if you're dealing with static loading with ductile materials to not worry too much about stress concentrations. Now, if either of those conditions are not met, you're in a different situation, okay? You're in a different situation because if it's brittle, then your material doesn't do this. You're, you know, it basically does this, right? That means that as soon as you reach that highest stress value, that material is no longer participating, right? And so now you end up with a very fast failure. Okay, so if you have a brittle material, don't do that. You do need to consider uh, stress concentrations with a brittle material. But if it's ductile, you don't have to worry about it so much. In fatigue, um, stress concentrations basically represent the beginning of a crack. And the best we understand fatigue, if you have the beginnings of a crack, it is basically makes a site that is much more likely site that you can initiate fatigue. All right. And since fatigue is not as well understood, we kind of just have to leave it there and say, with fatigue, it becomes a problem even if you have a ductile material. Although the more ductile it is, the less of a problem it is. Um, but it still is something you have to consider if you're dealing with fatigue. Long-ish long answer to that question, but hopefully that helps a little bit. And I'm glad you're thinking about it. Okay, let me, uh, I do actually have a whole other problem that I want to work real quick. So a lot of you are very concerned right now because we don't, don't have very much time left, but don't be too concerned, okay? Here's the other problem, okay? We have, let me, I'll clean this up a little bit. We have a tube welded to a wall, and it's welded with an all the way around weld. Okay. We're going to put a two kilonewton force on the end of the tube. It's nine centimeters cantilevered out from the wall, 50 meters, 50 millimeters wide, 40 millimeters tall. What we want to do is find the worst case stress for this situation. Here is the first thing that I want to say, and it is perhaps the most important thing that I have to say about this problem. There are two tables in this chapter for stress in weld groups. They look almost identical, okay? So page 476, we had torsional properties of fillet welds. That's the one we just used for the last problem we did. This is no longer a torsional problem. This is a bending problem. How do I know? Okay, here's how you know. If the axis of rotation uh, basically pierces through the plane where all the welds are, right? So you have a plane, an axis rotation is perpendicular to that plane, and all the welds are in this plane, right? If that's what you've got, you have a torsional situation, right? So you load out here, it ends up being torsional. What do I have in this condition? The plane of the welds, where do you think the axis of rotation is as the uh, body deforms a little bit? Okay, it's actually that little axis that I had here a second ago. There's an axis right here, kind of a neutral axis. It will rotate around that, right? And you might notice that that axis actually lies in the plane where all the welds are, all right? So this is a different situation in terms of the geometry of it. This is a situation where the welds experience bending, 
rather than torsion. Okay, so where you go to find information about this situation, you flip over a couple pages and table 9-2, again, it looks very similar to table 9-1, but they are each for their own purpose. And you see at the top, it says bending properties of fillet welds. Okay, so if there's nothing else you get from today, understand when you have a bending situation and when you have a torsional situation. Good news is bending situations are actually easier to handle than torsion. All right. So, and I'm, because you don't actually have the same level of concern and, and uh, difficulty in handling the geometry uh, that you do in a torsional situation. So here I'll say table uh, nine two. And we have a situation where we have a, a rectangular weld group welded all the way around. What entry in table 9-2 would uh, be applicable for us? Six, okay? And so, again, we use a very similar structure to this where we have a, uh, you know, a primary shear, which is a translational effect, and we have a secondary, which is a rotational effect, okay? What do you think you do for primary? Okay, but just force over area. So we have two kilonewtons over, they say there the area is going to be 1.414 H, okay, five millimeter weld all around, and then B plus D. B and D are the uh, respective lengths of the sides. So here we have 40 millimeters and 50 millimeters. So I'll handle secondary down below here. All right, so when we put those values in, uh, that ends up giving me, let's see, 3.143 MPA. Okay, now for secondary. Okay, for secondary, the basic equation that we have for this is that, you know, and, and I was about to put in a sigma there, we still actually use a tau, okay, because we're still assuming that this is a shearing stress because it's a weld, and we're assuming all the stresses are always in the throats, and it's always shear. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it as a tau. Okay, this is going to be equal to uh, MC over I. Okay, what do you think M is? Okay, the moment at the weld, basically it's the moment around that neutral axis, right? That's the neutral axis that I showed going through the middle of this weld group. It's the moment around that axis, which means you've got to take your two kilonewtons and multiply by nine centimeters. Okay. What about C, you think? Okay. Yeah, C is the maximum distance from that axis Two. Now here's a here. I'm gonna. There's a little bit of uh, interesting thing you got to think through right here. Um, this was a. This is a symmetric problem, so it's going to have the same distance there as it does down to here. Okay. So it doesn't really matter for this. We just take the half of the total distance, and that would end up being 20 millimeters. What if you end up with a case where those are not symmetric? Okay, it's a little different than what you do when you're doing beam design, for instance, um, yeah, or at least this is my recommendation. If you imagine this thing is actually welded against a rigid wall, the lower weld in this particular example, if it fails, what happens? It actually butts up against the wall 
and you're not in as bad a situation as if the top weld fails. Okay? So for this reason, I, it doesn't matter for this problem. In general, though, my, my recommendation is you should probably still evaluate stress to both sides, right? But really absolutely make sure you're okay on that top side, right? Um, not a bad idea to be okay on the bottom side, too, because you still don't want to break the weld. You still don't want a crack to show up down there if you can help it. But if you have a failure on the bottom side, it's not as big a deal as if you have a failure on the top side. You know, or when I say that, the side that's in tension, right? The side that's in tension is the one that's um, going to be a, a bigger issue than the side that's in compression. All right, so there's all that. Um, divided by I. Ah, I. That's, again, the, uh, the nut of this problem. Um, you'll notice here that it's a very similar method, though. I, U, right? unit value of our moment of inertia there. And it's given there in the book to be d squared. D, and notice here, this one's not, it matters, right? It does matter on this one which direction you take these dimensions, OK? D, um, and you actually, to make sure that you have this right, you might want to look at the footnote. It says, uh, unit second moment of area is taken about a horizontal axis through G the centroid of the weld group, OK? So for, the, for K6, that horizontal axis through G is actually that, um, you know, on that side, which means that the D value is going to be, for us, the 40 millimeters. All right, so 40 millimeters squared uh, over 6 multiplied by 3 times B, which is the other direction. OK, that'd be 50 millimeters, plus D. All right, and this gives us a value here that is pretty small. Let's see. I don't exactly know why I did it this way, but anyway, here's what I've got. 0.00005 uh, meters cubed. Well, what do I do with that? Okay, I've got to convert that to a regular I. It's the same type of process. We still do a 0.707 times H. For us, that's 5 millimeters times um, IU, OK? And IU is that value that I just found. OK, and so this ends up giving me, uh, let's see, 1.791 times 10 to the minus 7th. meters to the fourth. Plug that in up here, 1.791 times 10 to the, set to the minus 7 meters to the fourth. I know we got all kind of mixed up units in there. Uh, I'll leave it up to you to make sure you figure out how to do that. This ends up being 20.1 MPA. OK, and it's important I got to the very end here because we have one more calculation to do, and it may surprise you, OK? Um, when you get ready to, to combine primary and secondary shearing stresses, um, it's a lot easier than in the torsional case, because you just take the square root of the sum of the squares of these, OK? So your total amount of shear is equal to the square root, I mean, generally speaking, of your primary shear squared plus your secondary shear squared. Okay, <clears throat> and so we'll just put those in there. 
20.1 MPa squared. And what this gives us is 20.34 MPa. Okay. So again, just reviewing the particulars there, make sure you use the right table, all right? Table 9-2 instead of 9-1 if you're doing a bending case. And then it's different as far as how you combine your primary shearing and your secondary shearing stresses. Is that for, is that this, is for this, is, this is for bending problems generally. All right, I will see you guys next time.